no Mickey show. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs, stay fed, deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion, and it's melted by we live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights, highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The No Miki Show. Hello and welcome to the No Miki Show. It is Femme Friday, August 20th, a very unusual uh, Femme Friday. First off, I'm kind of in a lobby area at a hotel in which I have a wedding tomorrow I'm going to, and the Wi-Fi was really bad in my room. So I just have to start off with that. Like, I just feel like everyone's so much more patient now, given that we've been living in our homes and filming shows from our homes. So thank you to everybody for your patience uh, while I'm on the road. I will be back very soon. Um... This is unusual also because our dear friend Francesca is here at the top of the show because I wanted to talk about something that just broke right before the show started. And I knew Francesca was joining us. And this is a topic that she and I have discussed in many different ways and aspects. Um, It's starting to get a little noise on the internet. First off, Francesca is the host of The Habituation Room. And of course, uh, she's over at AJ+. Francesca, thanks for joining us. You're going to be back later to talk about more yeah. Fun news in Afghanistan. <laughs> yes. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. So um, this just broke. Reuters uh, published an exclusive by Mark Hosenball and Sarah Lynch saying that the FBI finds scant evidence that the U.S. Capitol attack was coordinated from important, don't bury this, sources. So I bring this up because... Mm, I feel like there are a lot of sources, including congressional members and people who showed up at hearings and security guards and people who were monitoring technology that also saw that there were chats and there were organized threads. And I don't know, there was an effing rally outside encouraging people to show up. What does it take? What what does coordination mean? Mm. No, I don't know where they're going with this. I don't know who those sources are. If it's like different QAnon shamans and QAnon fairies and then like Proud Boys. And um, and, and this is, again, uh, just a time where we have to understand that the FBI, a <laughs> big surprise, not going to save us. Not a good, not a force for good um, nine times out of ten. And first of all, it was coordinated. It was absolutely coordinated. We understand the Stop the Seal rally was planned. It was even assisted, not by, not just by um, politicians, state legislators from around the country um, and like right-wing MAGA sort of celebrities, but congressmen, Mo Brooks, Andy Biggs, uh, Paul Gosar, these are congressmen that pushed the Stop the Steal rally. The Arizona Republican Party put out tweets that said, um, that basically were retweeting people saying, I'm ready you know, to give my life to this. Retweeting, he's ready to give his life, are you? This is, there was, number one, it was planned. And number two, it was very, very, um, very much uh, a part of the plan to have a certain level of militancy and violence. Whatever it takes, we're going to do what it takes. Your election was stolen from you, right? And look, this is the, you know, the real thing is like, if there was actually a stolen election, yeah, maybe it would be cause to like, you know, be militant, but there wasn't. So these are all grifters on that lie and they absolutely coordinated this event. So like, I need to read more into this FBI report, but. What, what I really, first off, it was not a report. It is a, um, it is some sources from the FBI at a Reuters report. Let me make that very clear. This is not an official FBI report. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But what stands out to me is like this like legalese, right? Like, like first off, this isn't being argued in a, a court of law right now. This is not an official FBI report that is being put before, uh, whether it's Congress or an actual court of law. Them saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote this because what you just said, like, Andy Biggs, the Republican Party, were saying, show up to the Stop the Steal rally. Oh, but that's not a coup. That is not, that's not orchestrating attacks. That's showing up. And it just sort of like led to that in some way or form. So this is a quote <laughs> um, 
it really stood out to me. It's, it's a former senior law enforcement official with knowledge of the investigation. And, and of course, this investigation is the actual FBI investigation, which at this point has uh, the federal officials have have arrested more than 570 alleged participants, including, uh, but not centrally line, aligned with far-right groups or prominent supporters of President Donald Trump. So the quote from this enforcement official, senior law enforcement official was, quote, 90 to 95% of these are one-off cases. Then you have 5%, maybe, of these militia groups that were more closely organized. There was no grand scheme with Roger Stone and Alex Jones and all of these people to to storm the Capitol and take hostages. Okay, first off, um, I five percent still enough to do serious damage. Uh, I'd love to hear them make that defense when they're invading other countries, which we'll get to later. Um, But but furthermore. it's not necessarily, I mean, there were no hostages taken and I didn't know that storming the Capitol and creating, and actually terrorism, it was a terrorist act. And they pulled out weapons and went forward and stole documents and, and, and congressional members had to go into hiding. That doesn't mean that they were the intent. I mean, they're setting up this intent. It seems like it's a legal thing. Like, right. right. Well, the intent wasn't to, to, you know, we haven't found any evidence that they were trying to take hostages. Well, that Which wasn't is, the argument. Okay, yeah, the, the one, maybe they weren't trying to take hostages, but they were very much trying to overturn the election. Like, ask any person who went to that rally. There are ma- many, 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 many quotes on camera of people saying, we're going to go there and put our president back, make sure our president stays. They're going to certify the election results. We're going to make sure they can't. That was specific. When you say stop the steal, what's the stop part of it? How you gonna stop it? You know, and if you're not explicitly saying, you know, we don't want any violence here, you're gonna have violence. In fact, they were saying the opposite. So again, like, I don't think there was a coordinated effort between, you know, the electors and uh, Ted Cruz and Mike Pence to eventually turn overturn the election with the help of the insurrection. Yeah, we know that. We know because they were chanting, hang Mike Pence. We know there wasn't a broad coordinated effort, I'll, you know, despite Trump's, you know, deepest efforts to do that. You know, we know that Bill, Bill, Bill Barr wasn't on board for that. But like, was there an attempt to absolutely stop the election results from going forward and to overturn the election? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like, do, I do not know. I, I just, you know what it is? Here's what it is. It's the FBI saying we're not a third world country. That's it. It's the FBI going, oh, no, 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 see, we don't do that here because we're first world, you know, like Amazon Prime, blah, blah, blah. And, um, (laughs) you know, in order to maintain the illusion that we should be uh, like the hegemon, um, we must say that it wasn't really a coup. Yeah, yeah, not coup in history books. Like, that's it. It's basically to to pretend that that wasn't a psychic break in American democracy that we have yet to recover from and yet to hold accountable for. And we have absolutely should be a before and after when it comes to our politics. I mean, meanwhile, this, this came out a day after there were threats at the Capitol uh, by somebody who was a major Trump supporter who they, 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 they couldn't figure out whether or not like the bomb detonation was actually like a real thing. It, I mean, this is, I mean, they get these bomb threats all the time. The fact that this, escalated so much and was taken so seriously. Uh, maybe it's because of January 6th, maybe it's not, but it, it really turned into a, a national, I mean, people had to evacuate. So they're taking, at least they're taking it seriously. Um, Brad, our producer, brings up a great point, which which leads me to the, the, the electoral aspect of this. Uh, he asks, you know, in my honest opinion, this, this conclusion could be because if they concluded differently, that would mean that criminal consequences would be appropriate for someone very high profile, some very high profile people which is unacceptable. So for instance, if you have, I don't know, say like five or six Congress member, congressional members, or I don't know, three senators in which if those senators were tried, um, it may not bode great for holding, you know, possibly taking over the Senate and Congress next cycle. So you might as well get ahead of that. And what's the best way of getting ahead of it? Since the FBI has not issued the report, we find a couple of rogue FBI agents to go 
go to Reuters, a very acceptable news outlet, probably the most acceptable next to the AP in terms of being neutral to basically say nothing, nothing's up, nothing's up. Wasn't no, that's a, that's a really good theory. And I think that's very, very much correct. Um, because we know, look, the 14th Amendment says you cannot give aid comfort to insurrectionists. We've been through this. We've done this. And so, yeah, if you want to escape any kind of consequences, that's that's what you got to do. The funny thing is, is that do you see many Democrats other than the squad calling for the resignation of these senators and Congress people? No, sadly. <laughs> so if only uh, Democrats actually were, um, you know, were holding their other party accountable instead of like, chasing that bipartisan dragon, um, there might actually be cause to not label this a coup. But yeah, whatever it is, I, I am just like, I don't, I think I, I have faith. I don't know if I have faith, but I do feel like we, we can't keep, we can't stop uttering these dudes' names, these Congress people's names, Biggs, Gosar, Brooks, Cruz, you know, like who else? Holly. Yep. Like, oh, of course, Holly, yeah. So Marjorie we Hillary remember, yeah. and if Democrats are to get them out of power, they should remember to and absolutely use it against them. I'm, I mean, like this is 2022 personally. Hey, I might be wrong. I've been wrong. I'm not good at being right. The point is, is that I don't think it's a done deal for Democrats losing uh, Congress at all. If we play no. hardcore, if, if Democrats if you play pl hardcore. Exactly. If you, if you play the game the way it needs to be played and the way that you are in the moral right for it to be played. That's right. If there is a billionaire watching or a couple <laughs> out there who love our show and want to know how to win uh, against these despicable Republicans, put that money, the way that you know how to do so, well, put it into super, cap, super PAC and buy a bunch of ads in these districts and just recite this because let me tell you if they're in a tight district if they're in ted cruz's position already weak enough or josh Hawley's position already weak enough or any of the others it doesn't even matter if they're not weak just repeat that's what republicans do repeat that they are insurrectionists and they're not american and that they were trying to overhaul our government the message is not right wing versus left wing the message is they were literally being anti-democratic anti-american yeah. because that's what happened Francesca, I love you. We'll see you a little bit later in the show. You're the best. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. It is Fem Friday, as everybody knows who tunes into our show. And it's also a day in which uh, <laughs> we've been incredibly frustrated with the fight against fascism. Um, I don't know what could be more uh, clear <laughs> than the attacks on the Capitol, attacks on democracy, than um, folks storming the Capitol. But this is where we are. The FBI has said that it is not coordinated, as a, as as spoken by the uh, by Reuters in a report. But that's not going to stop us from fighting fascism. So we have to bring forward every single tactic uh, to fight fascism. And of course, this is something we discuss in the show all the time. Communism is a key aspect of that. Uh, Ava. I'm going to see if I get your name right. Majewska, is that correct? Perfect. Uh, is the author of, <laughs> perfect, thank you, is the author of Feminist Anti-Fascism, uh, Counter Republics of the, of the Commons. She is a feminist philosopher and a former affiliated fellow at the Institute of Cultural Inquiry. Uh, Ava, thank you so much for joining us and for writing about this. I'm going to mute my line because these crazy cicadas that come out every 17 years or so are, are in my ears so right now. But our audience knows I'm on the road. So, so um, let's just start off with what what inspired you to write this book at this moment, um, given your work in this space for so long. Uh, why why did we need to talk? Why was it that that this needed to be said that, that um, a great probably the best tool to fight fascism is through the feminist movement? I thank you so much. First of all, thank you so much for having me um, in your show. And I'm really happy to contribute to, to spread the, um, not only the anti-fascist good news, let's say, but also um, uh, this idea, which some years ago still seemed a little bit abstract and now it's becoming concrete, that feminism is perhaps at the core, at the center of today's anti-fascism. This is actually the fantastic discovery that I've made some time ago during uh, 
uh, a conference about anti, uh, about actually fascism and the roots of fascism, the research, the research of fascism that was conducted at the Polish Academy of Science two years ago in, nine, uh, in 2019 when we hosted several fantastic scholars from, from Britain, from, from Poland, from, from Germany, who were speaking about um, fascism and opposition to it in this very, I would say, male-centered way. So they were fantastic and very polite people who were extremely open to the idea that women exist and that we also, you know, contribute to politics and to, uh, and to uh, culture. Yet they were using um, uh, the very traditionalist paradigm in which um, political philosophy is, let's say, here, and then feminism is located somewhere on the margin. So basically, they, 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 they agreed to the fact that feminism exists and feminist politics exists and feminist theory exists. However, they were sort of conveniently locating it at the margin of the spectrum of the political theory. So therefore, there was anti-fascism, which was somehow not feminist, not anti-feminist, though, but not feminist, and then feminism somewhere on the outskirts. So what I'm, the operation I'm trying to do is actually to say, okay, today, especially in the political movements, in the mobilizations against ultra-conservatism globally, basically, because we speak about the United States of America, we speak about um, Brazil, about Poland, about other countries, Spain, the Mediterranean, where you are actually, so also Greece and, and uh, Italy and other places where um, feminists oppose to the return of the ultra-conservative ideology. Um, but also the, the movement uh, uh, Black Lives Matter it has been described and, and orchestrated by women, basically, right? So um, at this point, it was actually possible to say that the feminist agenda is actually at the core of anti-fascism. So we cannot anymore locate it, on, uh, locate it on the outskirts, on the margins. We have to see it as the core. And so when we look at today's fascism, uh, when we look at fascist tendencies, let's put it this way. So when we look at the politics, anti-misogynist uh, politics of, of Donald Trump, for instance, those aspects where, where, where he really treated women as objects and tried to find ultra-conservative way of, you know, marginalizing women, of, 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 of reducing the, our reproductive rights and, and political position. When we look at Bolsonaro, when we look at Kaczynski and our Polish government, who recently uh, restricted tremendously the, the right to abortion, we see that Today's, anti, uh, today's fascism actually um, uh, locates body politics, uh, reproductive rights at the core. So therefore the answer to today's fascism has to acknowledge um, this shift in, well, it's not a shift in perspective because if we look at Nazi Germany, obviously they also knew where the woman's place um, is. However, today, I think the resistance to gender theory, gender studies, you know, all this anti-gender movement. So I was also inspired by scholars who are researching today's far right, obviously, when, when I was reading their uh, work, Elżbieta um, Korolczuk, for instance, Agnieszka Graf, they, they published also in the American journals. They, um, uh, they speak about today's fascists or today's right wing as anti-women, uh, anti-LGBTQ, um, anti-reproductive rights. So I was like, okay, so probably next step in this, in this theorizing is that today's anti-fascism has to be feminist. Otherwise it will just meet, uh, miss the point. So although racism, anti-refugee politics, et cetera, et cetera, are obviously still also at the core of the fascist politics, somehow, <clears throat> the politics of the body, the politics of the um, uh, of, of, of gender is actually also um, central. So this is maybe... Uh, <laughs> no, this is, this is, this is fascinating because, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, in the US and the progressive movement, um, in some spaces in the progressive movement, there is a debate between uh, whether or not we should lean on identity politics or not. And... I personally find myself uh, frustrated with this uh, often because I think it's overly simple to just say, you know, identity politics, um, quote unquote, identity politics is used as a weapon sometimes by capital, um, by, you know, uh, those in power to to basically marginalize arguments and, and push them out of the equation. But simultaneously, uh, there's an intersectional approach to this. And and I think, you know, when when you say that feminism needs to be part of the anti-fascism um, uh, strategy or, or, or women, arguably, and supporting women and, and, and putting it forward, whether it's reproductive rights or, or other rights. 
putting women's voices forward. That's the strategy for anti-fascism, but is misogyny almost universally a strategy for fascism uh, alternatively? Because I feel as if this is not discussed enough and made clearly enough that, you know, whether it's Bannon's tool book or, or the, the five-star movements to whoever it is, it, it always seems to be a centerpiece. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I would say in, in my book, the, the last uh, one of the last chapters is called, um, is, uh, discusses um, weak resistance. And uh, this idea for weak resistance is basically that in order to, um, I wanted to say to revolutionize the, uh, the political, um, the thinking about political agents, but I can also say in order to uh, perhaps um, uh, um, revision, uh, uh, revise, sorry, the um, idea of political agency. We have to look at it from the perspective of those who have been conveniently put on the margin or discriminated against, etc. So if we look at the traditional model in the political philosophy, a traditional model of political agency, it's always highly heroic, super masculine. It's shaped to the... Um, uh, uh, to the, uh, uh, it's shaped for the masculine socialization. It's shaped for men, basically. So if you are a woman, you have to adjust. You have to either be as strong, as brave, as heroic as or the, you know, historical men were, or otherwise you have to gain this heroic and strong position. So, um, and this is also a tendency in fascism. You know, if you look at the ideology of Karl Schmidt of, of Nazi Germans, you see there. Um, this Ubermensch, they even they even say it. They want to produce the um, turbo uh, men. And actually, in English, it's a convenient uh, language because uh, "men" is uh, is the same word for for men and for like humanity. So basically, what they want is a Ubermensch, Uber person, Uber Uber people. Um, uh, so um, so if if we want to really um, Revolutionize, I, I, I will use this word. If we want to revolutionize the political theory, if we want to make it feminist as it should be, we need to look at the structure of how we understand political agency. And we simply cannot any longer understand it only via those criteria, criteria of heroism, of uh, sacrifice, of strength, of force, of explicit um, expression. We have to look at those who have been resisting. And here I, I was very much inspired by a Czech um, theater uh, writer, but also a president of Czech Republic, Václav Havel. So I tried also to look at theories uh, from, 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 from my region uh, of the world. And I found Havel who was amazingly interesting in, in his essay say the power of the powerless, um, where he spoke of this resi- of this mundane, perhaps, everyday resistance that you can perform, even if you are desperately um, uh, searching for a means of expression, and even if you know that the empire is much stronger than you are, and whatever you can imagine is probably futile, and yet still you can perform, you can, you can persist in, in this resisting position. So I was thinking of all those people who were um, survivors of, of, of traumatic moments. They are also not perhaps, uh, I'm not trying to say that they were not heroic or th- that they were not brave, but bravery or heroism is not the first aspect you see. You might be looking at a very weak, a very um, tormented person, and yet they survived, they resisted, they didn't give up. They basically were politically active in ways that for some reason, I mean, for patriarchal reasons, were not thematized as proper political agency. So what I'm trying to say is basically that to be political does not necessarily have to mean to be brave, explicit, um, uh, articulate even. Uh, 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 James Scott depicts uh, the peasants in uh, Southeast Asia who sometimes are protesting only by marching, whose... uh, 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 postulates and demands are sometimes even not explicitly mentioned. Those people are just um, continuing on protest in silence sometimes or with some banners, but um, not in, in those ways that we tend to imagine as political agency. And yet, there we are. So basically, rethinking the, the strategies of oppression and uh, and uh, uh, producing an intersectional feminist criticism of it is one part of what I'm trying to do. But another part is basically to look at resistance as not only performed by means of fight, by means of 
um, articulate expression, sometimes dissimulation, you know, this kind of resistance that Judith Butler is depicting in gender trouble uh, in, in the practice of drag. This is a very nice example of, 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 of I would, something that I would call weak resistance. It's not, you know, it's not a powerful, you know, strength-based performance of politics. It's basically a politics which um, dismantles the, the gender binary codes, which uh, uh, puts a question mark over how we imagine femininity, masculinity, and other forms of being a human, uh, a gendered human being. I, I hope it answers. answers. <laughs> no, no, of course, this is very, very, very thought provoking. Um, so, so obviously, sexism is not universally just uh, held by the fascists. <laughs> uh, we, we we struggle within the movement as well, and um, I think sometimes it can be difficult to uh, explain how forms of sexism exist on the left while simultaneously trying to build solidarity around supporting women and making um, feminism a centerpiece to the anti-fascist movement. What would you advise for folks who, you know, maybe maybe there are men in the movement who, or women, who see themselves as feminists, but may not necessarily fully understand all aspects of, of what it means to be a feminist and how that's crucial to um, the anti-fascist movement. And, and I, I say that in a sense of, okay, so maybe being in solidarity, like if, if a member, keeping it very simple, if a member of a squad is being attacked by uh, somebody on the internet who has sympathies towards um, fascists or is just angry <laughs> or whatever, um, mm -hmm. how, how do we ask our, our allies to support women who are being courageous so that they, there is this more collective, universally collective um, solidarity you know, in, 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 and backing them up because the truth is, is if you do have the courage to step forward as a woman, you're likely to get attacked more. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think there are all kinds of, and, and very, very many ways. So basically what I'm going to say is probably quite particularly built in my own, um, I don't know, scholarship and, and uh, activist experience. But one of my greatest uh, teachers, although I never met her in person, was Bell Hooks. And I actually translated uh, feminist theory from margin to center uh, into Polish. And I was one of the first people to teach uh, 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 about feminisms of color. So I work also quite a bit with uh, Chicana feminism. So, so with Gloria Anzaldúa, Cherry Moraga, and, and uh, other writers who, uh, whom I find extremely inspiring. And uh, it was actually the Professor Paula Baqueta from uh, University of Berkeley in, in, in uh, University of California in Berkeley, who introduced me to uh, to those um, well to to answer the and, and and Moraga, especially and I'm super and she's also practicing transnational feminism and, and uh, anti fascism since many many years. So she's also somebody whom I value tremendously. So basically there are all kinds of ways, but let's come back to Bell Hooks for a second. So Bell Hooks advises that men are also um, are also responsible for feminism. They, they, they should not only be allowed a place within feminist struggle, but they, they, as, as sexism and patriarchy um, makes men um, far less happy and fulfilled creatures, um, it's actually advisable for men to revision, uh, to, to revise, sorry, and to, to revolutionize perhaps their ways of being. So for instance, um, exclusive privileged uh, behaviors, all kinds of silencing of those who seem weaker than, than, than who we are, are practices that have to be revised. And this is extremely difficult. I, in, in my essay in Eflux, which can be found online, I depict a situation where I play a board game with four colleagues of mine who are men. And for 45 minutes, they speak among themselves. It's incredible. You know, we play, the four of us, and I start feeling like a five-year-old younger sister of those boys who is absolutely not, giving any, not given any voice. So I do what I usually do in this kind of situations when men are, you know, talking to each other and I'm out. I basically uh, speed up and start to win. That's actually, that's, that's, that's something, you know, that's, 
something that some people have basically is like certain intellectual capacity and the audacity to, to use it. Okay, you don't listen to me. I'm going to write one book, two books, five books, perhaps, you know, after the 10th book, I'm going to be heard. So basically some people, probably it's connected with some mild, uh, you know, autistic spectrum. Some people go to <laughs> go to the skills they have, whatever they are, artistic, you know, intellectual, whatever. They, they try to, or uh, you know, connection building. So being a friendly organizer, a friendly the manager even, or I don't know, in all kinds of professions, you can have this. So, so that's one, one of the strategies is kind of to try to gain your voice, basically. So for instance, within the discussions about, the, about let's say, the artistic or intellectual canon, I'm very much forward to attribute, uh, to attribute authorship to women, to people who are queer. There are now fascinating discussions in the art sector about how do we make inclusive collections, not only in the sense of having enough women in the collections, which used to be a concern, but also, you know, what about non-binary people? What about, you know, do we want to have a representation of lesbian art? And then how many percent, let's say, of the art collection? So basically, you know, so on one hand, there, there is there is uh, uh, an effort to gain some voice, to actually establish yourself as an author, but not in authoritarian way. So this becomes tricky already, because obviously the typical anti-authoritarian strategy not to be authoritarian is to resign from authorship. But then the authorship goes back to where it used to be always, to white privileged men. So I'm not sure if we can afford if we can afford this kind of, um, how do I say, generosity. I think that as underprivileged people, um, many of us might want to uh, exercise authorship, perhaps in a deterrent, you know, perhaps in a shifted way. Perhaps we can share authorship. Perhaps, for instance, when we speak on this show, it's your show, I'm the guest, so basically it's it's... A collective effort, right? It's like difficult to so 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 that's a way of avoiding this kind of stardom that used to be so individualistic. So I'm speaking about it also in my book about um, counterpublics of common understood as also an effort to dismantle this individualism, which is at the core not only of liberal politics, not only of conservative politics, but also unfortunately of many progressive social democrat and otherwise progressive uh, uh, politics, where there is the the me. And I'm the so, so basically I'm always a little bit you know it's a problem for me to put my name on a book because there is so many so this is why the thank you parts you know the the, the um, credits um, list is so long because. I feel that there were students of mine who wrote the book in a way with me, in a sense that when we were working in seminars and lectures, obviously they were contributing to my anti-fascism, also teaching me what anti-fascism is today. They are 20 years younger than myself. So basically we had fantastic conversations about how anti-fascist theory and anti-fascist practice has changed and how, for instance, the notion of privilege is central today. It wasn't like this 20 years ago. When I was you know, beginning to put my step, first steps in, in activism and anti-fascist theory, privilege was not at the center in the, in the debates, at least in Poland or in this part of Europe. Um, it was rather masculinity. We were trying to silence men, for instance, to say like, okay, you go silent, basically. For the whole meeting, you sit silently and listen. We were actually performing this kind of experiments. So we're saying, okay, one meeting is gonna be conducted by women only. You're gonna sit there and maybe sometimes take the voice, but if you can sit silence for, 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 for two hours, it will be fantastic because it's gonna show us how, you know, how even, he, you know, on the audio level, it's different voices. I, I have quite low voice for, for a woman, but still it's much higher than the majority of male voices. And men tend to only hear those low, uh, um, uh, uh, also this same audio kind of discrimination goes for accents. It's, 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 it's fantastic and scary to what extent uh, in Poland, for instance, Ukrainian people often speak very well Polish, but they have very heavy Eastern accent, as we, as we say it. It's a little bit like, I don't know, people from South America in America who speak full uh, fluent uh, English, yet they have heavy accent. And then racism begins already on this level of how, you know, somebody hears the accent and they go like, oh, you're not a full citizen. You're probably something worse. And this is a typical racist thinking, although the color of the, of the skin is not visibly different, right? But racism uh, uh, begins somehow in, uh, on this level of, of, of the audio. So basically doing all kinds of experiments and performing all kinds of unusual situations of reversal of power used to be a strategy that we were doing in all kinds of ways. Also in the classroom, Polish language is gendered. 
so we can address uh, um, somebody by, uh, as, a, as a woman or as a man. We are trying to experiment with them, although in Polish we have a neutral version also, but it's very much kind of objectifying. It's very much for objects. So not everybody who is non-binary wants to use this pronoun. So the son of my friends, for instance, Adash, the fantastic Adash, who wants to be non-binary, they are now uh, 11 years old. In English, they function as they, so it's easy. But in Polish, you know, they don't want to be this neutral uh, pronoun. So they change the grammar, um, uh, the declination, the uh, uh, conjugation of, of verbs. And they invented their own grammar. So I'm trying to learn it. It's very difficult. It's very new. But, uh, you know, so for instance, trying to make... Uh, new um, communication forms, new organization forms. This is not very difficult. It takes five minutes to adjust to a new um, uh, scenario. So these are kind of small steps that if we do every day, we are more careful, I think, on daily basis about those distinctions and differences. And we know from sociology, from Pierre Bourdieu, from, from, from Artisser, from, from Judith Butler as well, from Rancière, how those little markers of class, they, they were, you know, the French theory, works on it in class context, but Fanon works on it in, in, in anti-colonial context. So basically there are all kinds of spectrum. So if we practice on daily basis, this kind of little differentiation, and also if we try to use difference in order to learn more egalitarian world, that's already good. But I think that we also need to think, and this is why I speak of counter publics of the common, and this is why I try to sort of kidnap the notion of public sphere and take it away from the hands of liberal or conservatives, because I don't want it to be only in their hands. I also want to be capable to discuss the public sphere. And this is what outraged my anti-fascist colleagues in, in, in Poland, because they told me public sphere is such a reactionary concept. I was like, but it doesn't have to be. It can be. We can very well make it not only inclusive because I don't want to. Like, I don't feel entitled to include anyone. So I'm very careful with using this inclusivity uh, notion. Uh, but yet, I know many people who have fantastic uh, intentions and who are practicing it well. I cannot use it basically. So I'm, I don't want to include anybody. I think we are diversified already, and we need to. In our everyday thinking, in our everyday practice, we need to understand that the world is already diversified. There are groups of people, entire groups of people, who, who remain invisible for us. Even if we are leftists, feminists, queer people, whomever else, we might not notice that our neighbor belongs to some sort of group that we didn't even think of existed. Like, for instance, people with disabilities, we learn right now, uh, or, or psychological uh, uh, shouldn't use the, the word disorder already, right? But it's like- there's, there's, People have multi, there's multiple identities attached to people and, and oh, yeah, what right. somebody puts forward as first versus second, and it, it depends on the circumstances, you know? Simple example, I'm in Greece right now. Uh, I am a Greek American, but when I'm in the US, I identify more as, you know, as, as every, every aspect of you comes out in different ways at different moments based on your community and what you want to put forward. Um, I want to, I want to touch base just real quick because the public sphere is really interesting to me. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're not in a democratized world where the public sphere is accessible to everybody and, and everybody's voices are given the same uh, strength. I mean, we, we started off the show talking about how, at least off record, how this show um, on Fridays is, is here because it is the, the political YouTube site is a very male dominated space. And the algorithm is, is, has been outed as being sexist and racist. Um, and, and, and I fear, I personally fear that the silencing of other voices, whether intentional or not, or dealt with or not, or acknowledged or not, um, these things shouldn't be debatable, but they are debatable, right? Debated right now, uh, maybe intentionally, so so that they're not actually dealt with. But it's a form of uh, silencing is a form of fascism. So to, you know, get back to the the, the the first part is fascism has a toolkit, and silencing opponents and silencing dissent is a big part of that. And if if feminism is a central part of of, of challenging fascism and fighting fascism, you know when the space, the public forum is not egalitarian. How do we fight, especially in a monopoly world that we live in today? You know, how do we take that on? I mean, are there strategies we're not seeing today for the modern world that, that didn't exist 50 years ago or 100 years ago that we're just not seeing? I'm uh, uh, so for the, for the debate about public sphere, I'm looking at the 
<laughs> at some Polish events that happened in 1980, so around the year where when I was born. So a time that is distant, not only geographically for US American people, but also you know, <laughs> chronologically. Um, uh, but many of us probably heard the name Solidarność or Solidarity still. And uh, it was a movement that was created by means of resistance. So, and it was a solidarity strike that started after a woman worker of the shipyard, a woman who was not working in an office, who was a crane operator, was fired three months before going to retire. So it was a terrible, you know, terrible situation. And this woman, as she was a motherly figure for a lot of people in the in the shipyard in Gdańsk in Poland, uh, obviously um, her firing caused a lot of turmoil. So um, a solidarity star strike started and then different um, workplaces started to join. So basically, you know, this is a kind of, and imagine or not, believe it or not, after six months, this movement was registered as a labor union and it contained 10 million people. <laughs> it wasn't a milliard of years ago. It was, it was 40 years ago. It was still possible. Um, as, as, as somebody who tried to introduce a syndicalist union at the University of Warsaw, and um, you know, when, when I started to work with other people on the making of this union, um, we realized that it might be difficult to gather 10 people to open this union, 10, pe 10 people, not 10 million, not 10,000, 10. It was the, the University of Warsaw, it's 5,500 workers, employees. So it's not that it's a tiny little university which doesn't have, you know, employees. It's a big university, but everybody is so afraid of, of, of joining a proper union that they prefer not to, basically. So, um, so I'm looking at, you know, I'm looking at examples from the local experience and local area. Also, not to exoticize, you know, the experiences of, let's say, black Afro-American, Afro uh, you know, activists, uh, um, which, by the way, I mean, when I translated Bell Hooks, it was actually very useful. It was actually a discourse that opened the eyes of, of certain feminists to the problematic of class. So it's amazing how you have to get a, 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 an author from another hemisphere, basically, to comprehend something which you have, which you deal with on a daily basis, and which has been theorized, obviously, by Polish authors, by European authors, and by the you know state communism that we've had not so long ago <laughs> as a as a running system. So, I coming back to the to the previous topic uh, of uh, of the practice of of uh, anti-sexism, for instance, sometimes it's necessary to actually kind of go a little bit further or invite somebody from very far away. You know, and to see our own experience in a perspective that this person is setting. And uh, for me, it was the feminists of color. So feminists, black, like Afro-American feminists, the um, Chicano feminists. But this also matters for the public sphere because Poland is a country which uh, for the majority of our citizens, we think we are white and more or less, you know, similar in our situation, which is obviously untrue. And we have growing uh, discrepancies in income, in, in, in position we have now, a population of uh, half a million of Ukrainian citizens living in Poland and work and doing a lot of work for us and being treated like semi-humans, like semi basically. You know, so our daily racism is not necessarily based on color. Although, unfortunately, right now, for instance, we have Afghan refugees held on the border between Poland and Belarus by the Polish guards, uh, border guards, there are 50 people, defenseless, basically. They didn't bring, you know, arms or... They basically are asylum, asylum seekers. And they are being held for, for a week now on the, on the Polish-Belarusian border by the racist government. I must call my government this way because this is racism. This is, this is purely racist incentive. And luckily some social democrat parliament members also went there. So they sort of make sure that, you know, the case is televised and nothing bad happens to, to, to those people. But on the other hand, why are they, are they supposed to sit on this border in this no man's land between the borders? Um, um, so basically, coming back to your question about public sphere, we need to think of bigger scale as well. We need to look at our micropolitics, at our daily basis experience, because this is necessary. If we are racist or, or sexist to our you know, partners, children, neighbors, uh, students, everybody, it's, it's just uh, not going to help 
to build a different society and to understand, you know, bias and privilege, etc. But we need also to think about the scale. And I think for many years, the radical left was very preoccupied with micropolitics and was very preoccupied with not looking at the bigger scale. With going like, okay, we're going to make our little squad, our little this, our little that, and we're going to sit there peacefully. And But in the meantime, uh, of course, historically, you know, it was perhaps necessary to revisit those micro spheres. But, you know, the, the way we build, we have, we, we are gendered is made not only in micro scale, it is made, made on the big level of state run schools, of uh, churches who, in Poland, Catholic Church is a fantastic machine producing inequality on a daily basis. You know, we have the, uh, it's like a monarchy coexisting with a democratic society. On, on this level already, it's a paradox. I'm not speaking about God because I'm quite, I'm agnostic. I don't have good proofs that God doesn't exist. So I will not quarrel with anyone about it. I don't believe in it, but you know, I'm not going to contradict it. I'm quite open-minded in this way. But the authoritarian structure of the church in Poland is scary and it, it, is, it should evolve because otherwise it's just going to bring a bad example to the society which should be learned about equality. In our constitution, we have equality, and yet a priest is a better human being than a normal person. Come on. That's, you know, that, that, that has to be negotiated. And we need to have audacity to claim this kind of revisions. So basically, this is where the public begins. The public, as there is a fantastic author who inspires me a lot, Rosalind Deutsch. She's an American scholar working in, in the field of art history and art theory, and she speaks of critical art. Uh, sorry, of public art, not as one that is, you know, residing outdoors. This is a very common definition of public art. It's like something that is outdoors. No, we don't need something to be outdoors. We need public sphere or public art, for that matter, to renegotiate the relation between what is public and what is private. This is, this is what public art or public sphere is about. So public sphere is not only you know, a debate that happens outside of our uh, of our home. Because as pandemic is strong, we are sitting at homes and, and conducting public debates uh, very well. So well, it becomes public when we question certain composition of the society, when we question certain composition of decision-making, when we question the, the, the existing composition of what is perceived as important or common or um, ruly or visible. So when we have the audacity, so having the audacity of, of claiming like, okay, I don't like the way this government is organized. I don't want the, um, the men to have more um, of a say than women. That, requi that requires a certain audacity. However, it is not only by explicit uh, articulation that we make that, that, that kind of intervention. So this is one of the ways, is if we are powerful enough to have, a, for instance, a show on YouTube, which is which has some audience, which is already a sort of privilege because lots of people try it and they, they don't get to address a larger audience, right? So, so other ways are, for instance, protest, solidarity protest, you know, resistance to fulfill the duties. Uh, there were fantastic protests of Amazon workers in the time of pandemic. They, they, those workers were overworked uh, uh, and endangered to, 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 to get uh, COVID because uh, Bezos wanted to collect money for his, uh, whatever, he <laughs> whatever he wanted, right? So, so in other, yeah, uh, I was thinking of a white, uh, of a white big dick because for some reason I've seen some comments Penis online. Shop. That were comparing <laughs> the spaceships to, to, you know, a part of, of a male body, but... Um, uh, anyway, so uh, so you know, so 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 those workers, they were not, you know, making shows online or making or appearing in television. But what they did was basically to refuse to pack another thing that we ordered online, right? They refused to fulfill their daily duties, and by that, they made a point about how their safety is not uh, taken care of and how the, the workload and, and working hours are too long. So basically, there was old fashioned because <laughs> many people on the radical left already think that we are so, you know, so immaterialized and so detached from factory pro production modes that we have nothing to do with the 19th century um, forms of strike. By the way, interestingly, the first strikes were apparently made in the, in the US, uh, well, uh, in, in North America by Polish immigrants. 
in 16th or 17th century, I can't remember, but the first the first protest that was called a strike, so the first work connected kind of resistance, was actually it was actually Polish people. So it seems to run in the uh, in the in the <laughs> in the region, and I'm kind of proud of it because it's you know it's it's uh, th- this is this is a means of uh, you know this is a means of uh, of renegotiating what is common and what, what what is public in the region where I live. So basically this is what I try to you know bring into the global discussion. <laughs> it's like okay we have this example here yeah? we have the example of resisting certain forms of, of, of labor and via that resistance renegotiating. So for instance the women's protests in Poland were called women's strike, right? So what became the uh, international uh, women's strike was actually started in Poland. And was referencing the strikes that I mentioned, the solidarity strike with Anna Valentinovich, so the beginnings of solidarity movement. Our strike of today was referencing, our feminist uh, women's strike was referencing the strikes from 40 years ago. So the, they are interconnected, you know, they are not. <laughs> so, uh, so, 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 so my thinking of, uh, of public sphere is one which does not, um, which does not, which is not detached from workplaces and, and and the sector of work. This is, I think, important. In most classical narratives about the public sphere, labor is sort of privatized. It's basically our private business, where we work, how much we earn. These are not topics. So I'm bringing in not only Karl Marx, who obviously wanted to make the income also a part of a public debate. So a very interesting, you know, example of, of public thinker. But I'm, I'm bringing in the film producer and, uh, and theorist Alexander Kruger, who wrote about counterpublics of the proletarians. So who tried to explain how within the workplaces public um, issues are debated in a different way than the ones uh, uh, the public sphere organized within the bourgeoisie within the upper classes. So he made this point that actually non-bourgeois um, citizens, uh, not middle class citizens, are also producing public debate, but um, one which is built on different presumptions. So for instance, where the involvement in fulfilling basic needs is not excluded of what is public. That's the main uh, difference. So these are already you know, more, more details of, 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 of the theory I'm talking about, but it's important, it has implications for how we understand anti-fascism. Because in many, I think, in many anti-fascist politics, we are discussing about what, you know, about racism understood as a certain idea about the other. It's not about ideas, you know, in, when, when the Polish people are racist towards Ukrainians, it's not about our ideas. Most people don't think too much about Ukraine. It's basically about paying less because somebody does not have a Polish passport. So it's basically connected. So it's in the field of labor where this racism is. And I think it's, it goes the same in the US, right? It's it's channeling the, the, the frustration of the going back to individualism of the individual, um, which Trump did so well, which is not a t- new tool, uh, you know, and, and, and targeting it towards the other. I mean, you, and you see it at all different levels. It's 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 fascinating. And I, I, I keep going back to the tech space because you see multiple different um, allies of the fascist movement and actual what I would diagnose as fascists, um, you know, a, a, echoing each other and using similar tactics against different people. So on one hand, you might have the Trumpian folks who are targeting Mexicans for taking their jobs. Um, on the other hand, you might have the the uh, like the Jimmy Dore left, which I'm not expecting you to know who they are, um, targeting you know women for uh, specifically not not saying that you know it's women's fault, but they're only targeting women who tend to speak up about anything related to equality um, and simultaneously people of color. So it's, it's, it's really interesting how these tactics are, are all very similar about the other. And it's all about tapping in one group's economic anxiety, especially in the U S economic anxiety, status anxiety, and tapping into whatever it is, is their access point. And so, you know, sexism does exist on the left and there's economic anxiety in the left. And so how do you peel off those folks and bring them into this other space? Um, so it's, 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 it's super interesting. Eva, I could talk about this for hours. I could listen to you for hours. <laughs> you are, I, 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 I would love to have you back on. I would love to continue this conversation um, if you're open to it. And, and I'll be back, you know, in the studio, not in, in Greece. But I would really love to do so if, if, if you're open. 
very much. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, for me, it was also a pleasure to uh, to talk about it. And when you are in Greece, I, I hope you know all those fires are going to stop soon. And uh, I hope you're safe and <laughs> and, uh, you. and happy there. Mm -hmm. So far, so good. Uh, I, I I'm in Crete now, but I definitely got away from the the area of the fires earlier this week. So um, it's a whole other conversation. <laughs> I mean, okay, next time we're on, I want to talk about Poland because I remember just, I don't know, a half a year ago being like, I can't believe Poland's blocking all refugees to now it's happening in social democratic uh, led countries and center right countries like Greece, where everybody is now blocking refugees. Um, so, you know, I think that's a very good indication of how things shift based on, on the far right. Absolutely. I believe also that Poland, you know, since neoliberal times has been a uh, a place where certain things were introduced and then practiced uh, elsewhere. Obviously, you know, Argentina also got uh, their and Chile got their share of neoliberal politics, but Poland was in Europe one of the first countries to have this harsh neoliberal capitalism introduced as, uh, you know, as a shock doctrine, basically. I, I very much agree with Naomi Klein with the diagnostics over there because her chapters about Poland are fantastic. As, as, a, as, a, as, a, as somebody living here, I must only confirm that, unfortunately, her diagnosis is pretty good. Uh, so I think, and it was fantastic for us to see how this women's protests have spread throughout, you know, throughout uh, the world and how our communication of how we need to resist the um you know the sexist politics um by means of of ordinary you know people by by means of strike by means of we had also this moment of using social media which might be interesting for you so one of the first stages of the women's protest in 2016 was an invitation for women to 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 post on 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 social media their black and white picture saying i support black protest black for the clothes we were wearing so basically the color black was important to to signalize the the participation in women's strike so some 250,000 women, you know, posted the um, uh, support uh, message on, on social media. And for many of them, so my hypothesis immediately was that for many of them, it's going to be easier to, to walk on the streets, to, to, to take part in, in street protests after posting on, 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 on social media. And it proved to be true. So many women later were, were um, investigated by my friends, sociologists, you know, who might brought interviews with them and they were confirming that it was actually a kind of mid-step. So in Poland, for instance, the social media um, uh, social media impact on, on the protest was positive in a sense that for many people who are not political, politically active, the social media step was the first step to, you know, to, to uh, bigger activism. So uh, it was not only, you know, those who were um, political activists who orchestrated those strikes, but it was kind of ordinary people as well, as controversial as the category might <laughs> so. I mean, it's, 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 it's unfortunate. It's, it, the worse it gets, but it, the more people awaken. I mean, we, we saw it as well as with the election of Trump, um, how many people, but it's what you do with it, right? That's, that's a whole other conversation. What do you do for us? It was the Women's March. Where does that go afterwards? Where, what seeds are planted and how do those seeds grow? Maybe it's elections, maybe it's, uh, you know, other organizations, but, you know, tough times. <laughs> Ava, thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Stay safe and um, hopefully we'll have you back on soon. Thank you so very much. Uh, enjoy and uh, yeah, send me the link. <laughs> and thank you so much. It was very generous. And great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, everybody, you all know that I love Sunset Lake CBD. Sunset Lake CBD is a farmer-owned company. Farmer-owned. Now, you understand that? That's not Monsanto. That's not a big company. That's not a monopoly. It is a farmer, a farmer-owned company that ships craft CBD products directly from their farm to your door, wherever you live. Sunset Lake CBD has all types of products for everybody. They offer tinctures and gummies and salves and coffee and fudge and dog biscuits and lotions, all to help you out with your stress and your aches and your pains. And it's pretty amazing because, you know, the progress isn't just being a farmer-owned company uh, and being a CBD company and being a high-quality CBD company. It's that they are progressive all around. They took a Ben & Jerry's farm in Vermont and they flipped it and turned it into a premium hemp uh, farm. It's a diversified farm there now. And they support 
a rural economy, when you're supporting them, you're supporting rural economies, which is super important because we know our government doesn't do so. You're also supporting sustainable agriculture and meaningful employment in the community. And not only that, they support their workers. It is a majority uh, worker-owned uh, company, which is amazing. All the, empl- the employees own the majority of the company. And the minimum wage is $15 an hour. On top of all that, they're so generous that they are supporting progressive media like the Majority Report and the David Pakman Show and our show, the Nomi Key Show. Um, but um, you know, I, I love their products. My family loves their products. I know coworkers of my mom are using the products now and aunts are using the products. It's with very little uh, evangelism. It's is important, right? Very little evangelism, just like using a product. People have found themselves ordering Sunset Lake CBD products on their own. I haven't had to call folks up. This isn't some sort of like multi-level marketing thing. They're not even, frankly, they're not even watching the show. My, my family members aren't watching my show. Maybe they do occasionally. They just know I use Sunset Lake CBD and I love it. It helps me sleep at night. It helps me with my aches and pains. You guys already know all about my aches and pains, my sciatica, sleep at night. Um, you know, I love chocolate. And so when I get the fudge, I eat a little bit too much at once. When I eat the gummies, I eat all of them at once. I think that the uh, responsible thing for me to do is just take the tincture every night. And so that's what I do. It helps me sleep through the night. Um, I love the products. Dorsey from our show is a big fan of the coffee because it wakes him up, but does not get him jittery. He and his partner talk about this all the time. Uh, we love Sunset Lake CBD. If you haven't tried them yet, please jump on the site. It is a great product. Uh, there are a lot of CBD products out there that are not delivering you a, a really quality product. I promise you, you'll love it. And if you don't message me, but I'm sure that you will. And if you do love the product, please let me know because I would love to share your experiences if you're open with it on the show. Um, you can go to sunsetlakecbd.com and type in Nomi, N-O-M-I, and you will get 20% off of your entire order when you go to sunsetlakecbd.com and type in Nomi, N-O-M-I, for 20% off of your order. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. I am so excited to have our dear friend, Francesca Friantini. She is the host of the Bituation Room podcast and news broke on AJ+. Plus. Francesca, thank you for joining us on this very, very crazy week Friday, from Friday on, during this crazy week of uh, clusterfuck foreign policy. <laughs> Happy to be here as always, Nomi Key. Good to see you. So um, it's very hard to not have a conversation about Afghanistan and women um, and, and, and just the complexity of like, obviously things are moving um, by the minute. I think, you know, we covered this extensively in our show uh, the other day. So if our audience is watching, they've been caught up on where we are, There's some, some developments, but clearly it's a disaster in Afghanistan right now. I think that's indisputable. Um, and clearly we're going to have, there's a refugee crisis. Uh, and the question is, where do refugees go? But but yes, women are, I think it's undeniable that women are uh, at great risk under the, the, the Taliban government. But simultaneously, you're, there's this debate right now. Um, I feel that like the left is like really, some of the left is really focused in on uh, what caused us to get here rather than like, where do we go from here? And two things can be true at once. And so I felt like this is a good space to to discuss, you know, being anti-imperialistic and understanding that like the the the, the rationale and the causes and the roots of going into Afghanistan simultaneously while recognizing that yes, even though the right wing and the centrists are saying there's a feminist, you know, a, a nightmare there, uh, women and children are putting it are are facing extraordinary risk, that can be true too. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And you know, there is such a thing as imperialist feminist, you know, or um, feminism that centers uh, Eurocentric experiences and or white experiences um, that happens in many spaces, many places and is can be colonial. Right. I mean, there are 
the the excuse of liberating women um, from their captors or whatever has been going on when it comes to colonialism for, you know, throughout the history of civilization. Um, but of course, that doesn't mean that we deny um, how serious the situation could get. I'm not convinced it is at the same levels as when the Taliban was in power in the 90s right now. Uh, I think a lot of the, what we're talking is very, very preemptive, which is good, of course, especially when it comes to having some sort of humanitarian plan that is non-interventionist, that actually supports the women of Afghanistan directly and not through occupation. I just think the left really, you know, the problem is we have not been able to create a new kind of international solidarity movement that we used to have, I think, maybe um, in in like the 70s and 80s, especially in places like Central America, even when it came to Vietnam, right? There was a little bit, you know, you could find, um, you, you can't really ally yourself. No one's going to ally themselves with the Taliban. Of course not, right? So we're not going to ally ourselves with publicly. Sure. I mean, obviously, Tucker Carlson will go on his show, uh, you know, on primetime Fox News and ally himself with the Taliban. But of course, the left is not going to do that. Um, at least anyone, any leftist worth their salt. But the question is, well, then how and who do we, you know, ally ourselves with in a way that feels um, respectful and, and pro-sovereignty, pro-autonomy um, with whomever we're doing it with, whether it's a nonprofit organization parliamentarian, a, a, a politician that we support. And I think that sadly, the anti-war movement in the United States doesn't exist anymore. Um, it sort of fizzled out in 2005, was very active in it. Um, and had it continued, I do think some of some people were beginning to make inroads into grassroots connections with the people of Afghanistan and in Iraq. Uh, remember specifically the Iraqi Oil Workers Union. That was sort of a big uh, nexus of support that felt something like, OK, we can latch on to that as progressives, as leftists. So it's more. And I think as we go forward in this. It is going to be uh, incumbent upon us to find that international solidarity, especially as the far right in all of our countries, right, where Afghans will be seeking refuge, will only use this to further their anti-immigrant xenophobic agendas. You know, so once again, right, the harvest of empire, as they say, you know, which is unwanted, you know, immigration on both parts, right, because no one wants to leave their home country unless it's safer somewhere else. Um and that's what's going to happen. And so what is our response as as a left movement, if we can even call ourselves that? I, it, it, it's so interesting. I, I was seeing these um, memes spread around today. And, and it's so fascinating because, like, you know, folks I wouldn't necessarily uh, agree with on foreign policy, I'm suddenly agreeing with on foreign policy. And folks I normally agree with on foreign policy, I'm like, what is wrong with you? Yeah. You know, why are you so focused on who was right 20 years ago versus, I mean, and, and, and I think we're all kind of on the same page about that now. No, we'll get to that in a second. But it, it's more about like disputing the past rather than how we move forward in the future. And so you just illustrated um, aligning with, with folks on the ground. And when you're in a, s a situation like this, and, and granted, it's only been a few days, and yes, the Taliban is, seems to be, appears to be not as, as strong or, or powerful or dangerous as they were. Uh, 20 years ago, but it's been three days, four days. Um, we don't know where that could go and, and what circumstances uh, could, could um, lead to them being, you know, whether it's uh, controlled more or, or challenged more and who's a part of that um, and what behind the scenes kind of alignments would, would have to occur to do so. So I'm seeing these memes, uh, these, these photos, online being shared about, well, you know, is it our place to say whether or not a woman should be not wearing a burqa or uh, should be religiously, you know, religiously conservative? And I feel like there's a bastardization of what actually was occurring in Afghanistan, because you do want to go back to the people of Afghanistan. You want to go back to the women of Afghanistan. Yes, they were much more westernized, westernized. And I say that specifically, but simultaneously, women were more educated and did not whole wise want to be uh, controlled by the Taliban and put back into a role where they're 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 not as free to express themselves. So there's this there's this juxtaposition between is westernization something that is more liberating and what the Afghani people wanted or what women wanted in Afghanistan, 
Um, or is that just us pushing our agenda on them and our perspectives on them? Or is the Taliban <laughs> or something in between? Yeah. And I think these are really common for folks to understand. But in a moment like this, we in the left have to be really sensitive to autonomy, right? And and where do we get where do we get access to that at this point? How do we even have a clear illustration of that? Yeah, I mean, I think the short answer to your question is no, it's not our place. And that is a sad reality to come face to face with if you believe that the United States might be a benevolent force in the world or that Americans have anything to say or should contribute at all, right? Um, I believe a minimal role. I would love a certain amount of internationalism. I would love the UN to actually work, um, but it doesn't, right? And so do I believe that the US should go it alone or that our morals and values should be imposed on others? No, I absolutely don't. I really don't. And I'm sick of it after 20 years, you know, I'm, I'm done with this. And I think that's what folks are responding to. It's like the one place where I do become a little bit of like that lefty because I'm, I feel like, you know, we are old enough to remember and I came into my um, radicalized formative years when the media was resoundingly telling me that in order to be the most, you know, pro-feminist, democratic, you know, person I could be, it was to support a bloody occupation of a foreign country. And it was like, what? What are you? And so these are not, these are the same media figures practically spitting the same lies owned by the same people, you know, lies or not, right? It's like, it's like, okay, so now are we believing us or do we need a reckoning? And I think what the left is saying is we need a reckoning. It's not to say we don't move forward. It's not to say we don't, we're not solution oriented, but we need a reckoning and we need a gut check of the ways that, again, our, um, our empathy is, is weaponized and manipulated against us. Our, you know, um, you know, like values of, equality and democracy are weaponized against us. Meanwhile, look at what's happening in our own backyard. Look at what's happening in Texas with abortion rights. Like, I mean, look at what's happening everywhere in this country. Um, so there's a lot of that, and I think that's very, very real. That being said, there is, there is a responsibility the United States has now that it's left, and I think it's on, we have to figure out what those demands are. I absolutely think. And I think, I think folks are figuring that out. You know, I think right now saying, you know, opening doors to refugees, giving, you know, uh, asylum seekers asylum, that, it, that feels like a perfectly uniting and incredibly transformative thing to say that, of course, the right wing, you know, hates and will hate. Um, so, so that feels like at least something concrete right now. But I think what you're seeing is that reaction to a lot of mainstream media figures who we remember, you know, shove this down, down our throats and like, we're not going to have it a second time Thomas around. Freeman. Yeah, exactly. Thomas Freeman, the same people who get in these op-eds, you know, and not only that, you've got op-eds disguised as op-eds, I guess, is like, oh, I'm just a random person. They're former generals who like worked with McChrystal. They're Lockheed Martin straight up paying for op-eds being like, we should have waited longer. So, that's one piece. The second piece you're sort of talking about is also the ways that um, the ways that some folks on the left didn't expect Biden to double down on his decision to leave Afghanistan. Right. And let's be real. Um, kudos to our president for doing that. I'm sorry. I've never been more proud of Biden until this moment to being like in the face of these reporters. But aren't you? But aren't you? But aren't you? It's like, shh, 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 no. This is what we're doing. We've made a decision and we're doing it. It would have gone on forever. And he's like, then he points to his record on it. And it's like, damn, he does kind of have a record on it. And so, you know, talk about a gut check of like, if you're so against, you know, centrist neolibs to the point of orthodoxy where you can't see the one places that they're actually doing something that no one else would have had, you know, the cojones to do. That's on you, bro, because in like objectively, if it comes to advancing progressive values, if it comes to dismantling U.S. military uh, might around the world, U.S. empire and imperialism and all of these ventures, this is a step in the right direction. Don't get me wrong. We might get involved somewhere else. Hey, you never know. The, the administration is young. I wouldn't put it past Biden to get involved somewhere else. But this is a huge step. I mean, w with that being said, I, I look to Libya where... Um, Libya and Syria, right? Those were two locations. And, and it, again, like, like you said, it doesn't mean that they're not going to get involved. The, the administration is not going to get involved somewhere else. The Obama administration had a heavy hand in, in many places around the globe. But uh, I believe partly due to his um, 
what brought his, his path to power, being anti-Iraq war. And, and frankly, honestly, uh, Biden, who, who had a completely different foreign policy philosophy than Hillary Clinton, Secretary Clinton, and they were known to, to be at odds with each other about this. Um, I think that, that Obama had a fear of boots on the ground in places like Libya and places like Syria. Let's remind people, there were no boots on the ground in those places at all. But simultaneously, they turned out to be utter effing disasters. And so I asked you a question, not whether or not we should have boots on the ground. I think both you and I agree we should not be intervening anywhere, even if the alternative is, and I think ultimately this is the strategy or one of the strategies with, with Biden was to put the, you know, if China wants to invest in all this infrastructure in Afghanistan, then you put in the security forces, you take care of it. That's, you know, we're our country at, this, at the expense of healthcare and education and everything that we complain about and is is putting our taxpayers' dollars into supporting China's financial interests. So there's that. But is there a is there an actual foreign policy strategy in which you can have no boots on the ground and somehow I mean this has been done, right? And somehow help the people of that country facilitate whatever version of autonomy they yeah. want and not have slave trades coming, especially in oil rich countries or mineral rich countries. Yeah. I mean, the other way is like, you know, how do you support democratic elections? You know, Hey, you know, look, I'm not saying Gaddafi was, you know, amenable to this, but if you get Egypt involved or you get, you know, like neighboring countries involved, yeah, you've got better chances than if it's like a NATO led intervention that NATO is not internationalism. Let's be real. And it really sucks that like for me to be like, I think we need to dismantle NATO, which I totally believe we need to dismantle NATO, but also that's like Putin's line. And I'm like, ew, you know, I'm not, I'm not parroting Putin's line, but do I, do I agree that it's making things worse in the world? Yeah. Is it outdated? Yeah. That's not internationalism. So that's one thing is like, when you talk about an international coalition, who do you mean? You know, who do you actually mean? I'm just going to put this out there. The Taliban in the last 20 years, they set up like a, a an office in Doha, Qatar. It's like, oh, they've got an office? Cool. Weird, but cool. They're like professionalizing and trying to be more of a party, you know? And, and look, you could go two ways about that. You could be like, no, never. Like they're harbored terrorists and they're awful to women. And okay. But like, they're actually showing that is a first step to saying we believe in a certain amount of di diplomacy that we want to be able to negotiate our way out of this. So that's the thing is like creating pathways for unsavory um, author uh, autocrats or regimes to negotiate their way out of things rather than what we did 20 years ago, which was you're either with us or against us. We're going in guns blazing. You either die and we're not offering you a, a time to surrender. Look at Iraq, man. Everyone that was associated with Saddam Hussein out. Well, guess what? The people associated with Saddam Hussein knew how to run a government. That was, I mean, like, you know, that's, no, no, no. I mean, I, I can speak bad government working in Libya. Yeah. I, I, if, if you don't know where the lights are, I mean, it was, it was one of these extraordinary experiences where suddenly I was there, like working with young people who had internet for two years and could speak English and not that that has anything to do with it, but they were able to communicate with me. And when I was there to like, I was just, it was crazy. They're like, okay, tell us about free elections. And then it was breaking down free elections. And then because it was a rule that you couldn't have anybody from the previous government, I was like, which way do I turn? Where are the buildings? How does, nobody knew. Wow. Because it was, it, sorry to interrupt, but that's- that's No, a it's a perfect example. With a lot of these. Um, that, that is a perfect example, exactly. And, and, and again, this is not giving a pass to anybody, but it is saying that going in guns blazing the way the United States tends to do, doesn't work, you know, and that, yes, how do we create uh, some way to be a partner in facilitating a democratic election versus being a partner in facilitating a coup? You know, we, we, the idea is no bloodshed. And, and the one thing, look, I'm not saying the Taliban is good, but what I will say is, my God, the, the lack of body count in this takeover of Afghanistan is striking. Like the fact that it has been, not bloodless, but like sort of relatively is bizarre and and also a little bit of a lesson, right? Like, hey, when there is popular power or more popular power, you know, this is what happens. People will lay down their weapons and they realize they're not going to fight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
and that whole narrative of why didn't they fight more? Shut up. Shut up. Well, they had all the weapons. Shut up. Stop it. Not all the weapons in the world. Anand Gopal wrote this great book, uh, no, no Good Men Among the Living. He's now back. He's a journalist back in Afghanistan, as most journalists who've covered Afghanistan are there right now. And he's like, you know, yeah, because guns don't buy you legitimacy with the people without a, with zero moral judgment. I think that's the problem with people on the left generally is like we have to do two things, right? We have to have some sort of sober analysis of a situation which needs a progressive and a leftist perspective, number one, i.e. the people in Afghanistan didn't know their head from their ass. You know, like not, not the Afghans, the military, the U.S. military in Afghanistan didn't know their head from their ass. And then the second part is our morals. And problem is, is that leftists often we just you, we wear our morals on our sleeves, you know, completely, you know, and and we're, we are not able to marry the two into sort of a salient political position and sort of what we're fighting for. And I think, sadly, liberals actually coax a lot of people into supporting the Afghan war because they wear their their values on their sleeves, which are, you know, you shouldn't wear a burqa. You shouldn't wear a hijab. And like, again, I kind of separate democracy from the idea of not wearing a burqa or a hijab. That is a personal decision. Uh, that is a can be a familial decision. Even look, I don't care. That is well, number one. 150% not my business, not the United States government's business. And we've seen the ways that women throughout history, especially in the Middle East, when it comes to the hijab, when it comes to niqab, when it comes to the burqa, how that has been used um, as a tool of imperialism, right? The Shah in Iran saying, now we're going to westernize completely, right? And then the Ayatollah coming to power and saying, no, 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 now you must wear, you know, uh, the burqa or, or a hijab. The point is, stop making that part of your political agenda and leave it up to women to display their own faith and religion the way they see fit. I'm looking at you, France, in the year 2021. I, I 100% agree. I mean, uh, with Westernized countries. But how do you facilitate that when your politics is so intertwined with religion, unlike France, which, yes, Politics is controlling religion and pushing and, 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 and demonizing religion, just as we do in the states, by the way, with the far right and and mega churches and uh, and and evangelicals, um, which are trying to intertwine their religion into politics. And they are succeeding at that. Uh, the Christian coalition, of course. So, how do you succeed at that? Yes, it would be wonderful if 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 Afghan women could have some sort of uh, you know a, a voice in 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 their futures, but when government may or may not be so intertwined with an extreme right religion or religion being weaponized as an extreme right or conservative um, mechanism to control women, you know, it, it's not necessarily like, oh yeah, we'll just give women the right to decide on their own. But how do you do that when you're in a country that makes it very difficult to do so, whether it was the seventies or prior or today? Right. And I think this is sort of where, you know, if Afghanistan wants to be treated like if the Taliban want to be treated like a serious government and if they want to be, you know, treated or like by their allies, by the people they're trying to like, you know, prove themselves to as a serious ruling body, they need to keep the parliamentarians in Afghanistan who are women, which and I'm not look, I'm not saying that like there were not advances for women in the past 20 years. There were women went to school. Women served are serving in government right now. And look, I don't know what's happened in the last day, but initially there's been open, like an open agreement from the Taliban that they'll allow women in parliament to remain in parliament. Now that could switch very, very suddenly. Who knows? But the other thing is this, the Taliban only ruled for like five years. The U.S. occupied the United, the Afghanistan for 20 this isn't the same Taliban. You know what I mean? Like, it might not be. They might be, you know, tw a Taliban 2.0 or whatever. And it might be less bad. I'm just, again, not making a moral judgment, just making an analytical judgment about what might be going on. Uh, I think they want to be taken seriously. I don't think they want to provoke more intervention. I think they know that, look, especially they've got fighters who are, like, not necessarily following their rule from, from Kabul. If they keep on having, like, fighters acting out, apparently there was, like, they were putting out hotline numbers to call. If there was, like, fighter were fighters who, or, or any Taliban um, uh, associates, you know, or, or who were not 
who were like stealing from locals, who were hurting people. There was like a number apparently, who knows? But there is a little inkling that this might be a different Taliban. Now, the other part of this is the amount of preemptive you know, uh, excitement coming from the media and from, from Afghans themselves who were rightfully scared, you know, we need to leave. We need to, you know, cover up any images of women that depicted in the media or like on a, on a advertisement. And I think some of that is understandable. And some of that is like interesting because that's not their world anymore. And so it's like, how do we support Afghans in saying, Look, Taliban, you might have control, but this is not your world. This is not your Afghanistan anymore. We're different now. You know, and it's like, I I think that some of the preemptive fear could lead us down the path of like, okay, well, then we'll just go back to the old Taliban rather than like, no, it's been 20 years. You've been gone. You missed stuff. I mean, yes, you've been around, but you missed some stuff. I'm obviously being a little facetious, but I think you know what I'm what I'm saying. Um, So I I, want to just end with this footage from um, CNN because it's, it's making the rounds a lot uh, with Chris Ward, who is a, uh, for those of you listening on audio, she's a, a female journalist. She's been um, in Afghanistan uh, and she has, there's been some like memes of her out there a couple days ago where in one photo she was fully covered, but she's in the streets. And then in one photo she wasn't and the right wing weaponized that and was like, see, she was, you know, everybody wants to turn everything into a political statement. Um, you know, that, that, she claims that like, it's not, it's not safe on the ground, but then here she is with, you know, completely uncovered and she's inside and there's different rules inside versus on the streets, which is really important context. This is why I've also seen people say things um, to other reporters about, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. It's like, well, you, when you're on the ground, you do have, a, you, you, whether or not you're restaurant, you have a deeper sense of, 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 of the rules of the game. So she's had to fact check that. But uh, this video has been, <laughs> making the rounds. Um, and I just, I just want to, I just want to, there's no perspective I have on this. I just want to leave it out there because the truth is, is that people are having a difficult time getting, um, leaving the country if they want to, um, whether evacuating or potential refugees, because the reality is, is on one hand, yes, the Taliban may be different. The Taliban may have a political, be a political weapon for the U S or some other country. Um, for all we know to block ISIS, for instance, um, or, and I say that because there's been this battle between, uh, the two, you know, over the last 15, 20 years. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot that more that could be the agenda here, but there are still people who want to leave and who are we on the left while we might be saying, we don't want to intervene. We don't want to have a, we don't want any troops there at all. We don't want to neutralize. We're also not making it easy for people to leave. And so we're simultaneously recognizing that there is the potential of, of, of a refugee crisis. And so the definition of a refugee is assuming that there's an oppressive government. And so we, as we just laid out, you've just laid out, we don't know necessarily how oppressive this new version of the Taliban is, but we know that there are people who have those fears and anxieties based on, on, on previous uh, control. Yeah. With that being said, the U.S. has done an absolutely horrible job preparing for this rollout. And uh, whether it's reporters or NGOs or government officials, um, I can speak for myself. When I had to leave um, Libya, I didn't even know I was evacuating. They were just like, yeah, come back later. (laughs) And then like everybody evacuated like within a month. It was a much more sophisticated rollout. Um, This not so much. It's shocking. Shockingly so. So let's play this footage of a um, Clarissa Ward who's on the streets uh, dealing with, you know, reporting on the streets. Let's play that. Let me try to explain to you the situation where we are. It's very hectic. You can probably hear those gunshots. We're about 200 yards, even less than 200 yards away from the entrance to the Kabul airport. We just drove through it quickly. It's absolutely impossible uh, to stop there. And I say we drove through it quickly. You can't drive through it quickly. It's bumper to bumper. Cars are barely moving. Uh, There are Taliban fighters all around. Uh, We actually did see them physically. 
with truncheons, trying to get them back. We have seen them and heard them a lot as well, firing on the crowds to disperse the crowds. It's a little difficult to see from this vantage point, and it's a slightly edgy situation, so I don't want to push our luck. But all along the roadside over there, there's just hundreds of people who are basically waiting, desperately trying to get out of the country. It's not clear if they have their paperwork in order, if they've been declined uh, and told that they can't enter the gates, or if they simply uh, don't have the wherewithal to get inside. A cameraman, Will Bonnet's just panning off right now. You can see it's a pretty large crowd who's formed around us already because this is a slightly unusual situation to be doing live shots from here, I think. But um, it's definitely chaotic. It's definitely dangerous. I will say this. Uh, the Taliban appears to be trying to disperse the crowds, and there are crowds there of young men who seem to be just engaging in, like, criminal activity. I don't know if you heard that. Uh, they're kind of running towards the Taliban and then um, running away from them again, almost like it's a game. But, you know, when there's bullets firing like that, Brianna and John, it's clearly not a game. We heard the gunfire there, Clarissa. All right. Um, so there have been, um, you know, there's been a lot of footage. There was one where um, a few Taliban uh, members approached her and were very aggressive um, about her reporting. And then she had to essentially communicate that she'd been cleared to report. Um, I mean, I think it's really hard for us as Americans to conceptualize that, even though there's obviously a, a more sophisticated war on the free press here. Um, I mean, what's your, what, what's your take on this? I mean, there's just so much to unpack here, whether it's the refugees, you know, not being able to leave or just this sort of reporting on yeah, go ahead. I mean, I, I don't think we should extrapolate too much on what we just saw, but I will say that uh, she has big old ovaries, like just huge, huge ovaries. Just be standing there in the middle. Hell yeah. Female reporter talking about, you know, what's going on. And yeah, she's being slowly surrounded, but it doesn't seem like any of those men are necessarily hostile. Um, they're just watching what's going on as happens whenever you set up a live shot, even in Los Angeles, we were like, hi mom, you know, like that kind of stuff. Um, so there's some of that. Um, but I think that, you know, she's also holding her own. Right. And, and, and I, you know, I would love to continue and watch all of her interviews because I'm sure she actually allows those men to speak. I think that's really important to hear, hear from them directly, um, men, women, children, whomever. Um, but obviously, like as a journalist myself who's been on the ground, I'm like, well, I bet I hope there is someone who is big and burly working the camera or as your fixer or doing security because that's what you need in that kind of a situation. Oh, 100 percent. She's the, with the guns went off and you're like, uh, she's chill. That, that yeah, was not. <laughs> and yeah, of course, if, if, you, if you've been a war correspondent, you're used to guns going off. I mean, whether it's in the evening, on the, you're, you're sitting on your rooftop doing reporting and you hear it in the distance or, you know, closely, you know, close in your, in, in your vicinity. Um, I mean, and, and this is like, again, this is where I play like ultra lefty on this, like. Let's be real. How many journalists have been surrounded by MAGA Proud Boys oh, and oh. been threatened with their lives in the oh. last four years? We don't got it super good in this country when it comes to respecting the work of journalists, especially with female journalists. But it doesn't mean one or the other. We should no. be making it clear that neither no. No. is appropriate. But it, no, she's doing a job, right? She's doing a job. And I think the problem is, is when we extrapolate to say, what does this mean? What does this say about the country? It doesn't say anything. She's doing a job. And yeah, it is more dangerous to do that job as a woman in that country, but she's doing the job. She's trying to report. Let's listen to her reporting. Yep. Francesca, love you. Love you. Keep it up. Thank Stay you. Safe. Hope the fires don't come from two different fireplaces. Be safe. <sighs> I'm just blowing them away. That'll work. I think it's giving yeah. them oxygen. Um, okay. Thanks, Nomiki. Thanks for having me. Much love. Take care. Thank you for joining us on Fem Friday. Uh, the light's going down, as you can see. I can see like half of my face. Um, <laughs> oh, internet. Um, thank you to everybody for joining us today. It was a really thoughtful show. Uh, we are super excited to continue this conversation uh, next week because we have more people on next week to talk about Afghanistan the layers of Afghanistan, the onion, um, really understanding it from a leftist perspective. 
uh, and the multi-dimensions of it. But in the meantime, check out the committee program on Monday. It airs at 3 p.m. Eastern. You know they got some stuff to say, and they're going to say it from like maybe not an American perspective. Maybe some Western perspective. Not really sure what the programming is uh, is moving forward on Monday, but I have no doubt is going to be unlike anything that you have seen in political left media in the last week. So go check out the committee program right here on our channel on YouTube and check out the committee program on Patreon as well. And for those of you who are not already joining us on Patreon, go to patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. That is how you can send us some love. You know, we're fighting the algorithms. We don't have the big algo dollars, so we rely on you. And we're very grateful to everybody who supports us, especially when we're on the road, while we're on the road dealing with Wi-Fi issues. I even got like a booster and all this other stuff. And you know, none of it works. Um, but we'll be back in the studio soon. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend and stay in solidarity. The no Mickey Show. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs stay fed. Deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion in this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The No Mickey Show.